I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker, Dr. Corey Casper. Dr. Casper is an associate professor of medicine um, with adjunct appointments in epidemiology and global health at the University of Washington. He is the associate director of the University of Washington Fred Hutchinson um, Center for AIDS Research. He is the director of the Uganda Program on Cancer and Infectious Diseases at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center and the director of their scientific program on AIDS-associated malignancies and infections. Corey has been very active as a principal investigator. He is the PI for the AIDS Malignancy Consortium grant in Seattle, and he's the chair of the AMC Capacy Sarcoma Working Group. He is the principal investigator on an R01 that's studying HHV8 and HIV-associated malignancies, and today he's going to tell us a little bit about a supplement that he's received to focus on Burkitt's lymphoma. Um, he also is the principal investigator for their D43 training award in Kampala. So you can see that he's quite accomplished in terms of his global cancer work. Uh, it's really a pleasure to have him here, and he's going to talk about new strategies for cancer treatment and prevention in Sub-Saharan Africa. So welcome, Corey. Thank you, John. Thank you for the kind introduction. <coughs> just here? Okay, perfect. Well, thank you all for coming. I appreciate it. And uh, the columns present an uh, interesting challenge for eye contact. Is <laughs> <laughs> anyone hiding behind that? Uh, I'm looking at you. Uh, anyway, uh, so welcome. And I, uh, I have a whirlwind presentation. I'm from New York, so I've been told I talk quickly. Um, but I'll try and talk a little less quickly. But I did really want to give a flavor of a lot of the activities uh, that uh, I've been uh, involved with in Seattle, uh, really trying to sort of uh, start a new discipline in what, uh, what many would call global oncology. So today what I'll describe is a series of things. Uh, I'll go into the research activities, and my research focus has been on viral-associated malignancies. So I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and then I'll also talk uh, quite a bit about some of the other cornerstones of our program, which I frankly feel are very important for a global program, and they include education and capacity building, as well as clinical care. So that's a lot to get through in an hour, and I'll uh, try and do that, but if you have questions, please feel free to stop me. Um, so if, you, uh, if I lose you, I know that there's someone who's just off the plane from China, and if I lose you right now and you don't remember anything else from this talk, I just want to impress, you, uh, impress upon you three facts. Um, so the first is that I'm going to try and make an argument today that uh, really cancer is an increasingly important problem in global health. I think that um, for many, global health is uh, something of the purview of infectious disease doctors or way back when I started training in tropical medicine. Um, but the argument I'd like to make is that cancer is, is probably uh, up there with the world's greatest global health threats. Um, the statistics would tell us that more people die of cancer in low and middle resource countries than of HIV, tuberculosis, and malaria combined. So clearly cancer deserves to be a global health issue. Um, I want to tell you that cancer is not only a problem of resource-rich countries. So when I first started doing this work, everyone said, why are you working on cancer in a place where no one is wealthy enough to afford to get cancer? Um, but 70% of new cancer cases are in low and middle income countries. And so clearly this is a problem of, of lower resource areas. And really probably most importantly, if you forget both of those things, what I would like you to remember um, is the argument I'll try and make is that by studying cancer and by studying it smartly um, in international settings, we can make rapid and meaningful benefits against cancer, both for people living abroad, but also for people in the United States. So those are what I'll try and sort of impress upon you uh, in the next 40 minutes. And I'll try and tell you a little bit about the model that I've used to get at this issue, and really a model that's based on close partnerships, and again, on not just research, but on capacity building and clinical care. So the first part of the talk, I just want to sort of acquaint you with what uh, the burden is of cancer around the world. So these are not my work. These are slides that are, uh, or these are my slides, but they're from work from, uh, uh, from uh, collaborators and from the WHO. So first what you'll see here is that um, these are where I make the statement that more people will die of, of cancer than of HIV, tuberculosis, and malaria combined. Um, these are the numbers. So it's expected by 2020 um, of the uh, more than 10 million uh, global cancer cases that will happen uh, in low and middle resource countries, you can see that that will dwarf HIV, tuberculosis, and malaria combined. Um, you can also see that these curves are very much divergent, where that the number of new cases in industrialized countries uh, is growing at a, a steady pace, but certainly one that is uh, a fraction of the pace of the increase in cancer cases in resource-limited settings. 
So based on this, I would say this is a strong argument to think about cancer in places other than just here in the United States. Um, this is not a, a slide that you were meant to see in any great detail, but what it's meant to show you is that there's a wide world of cancer. And so when you talk about studying global oncology, it really depends on where you're standing. So here in the United States, our most common cancers are not the most common cancers that we see in East Africa. Um, when I speak with trainees and other students in global health, and they, I ask them why they're interested in global health, I always ask them, uh, they ask me how I got interested in it, and my interest in it comes from the fact that the disease that I've studied, Kaposi's sarcoma, you'll see is the most common cancer in the region of the, uh, at least in the general population, in East Africa where I work. So I think a strong motivation for studying cancer internationally is if the particular disease that you study is of extremely high incidence in an area that is not where you live. And I can tell you that in 2012, the place to study Kaposi's sarcoma, one of the things that I study is not Seattle. There were five new cases of Kaposi sarcoma <laughs> in Seattle last year, whereas there were 2,000 in Uganda. So clearly, uh, I think geography is important, and the motivation for a global oncology program, in my opinion, should be based on where you want, what questions you want to answer scientifically. Um, so not only is cancer common in resource-limited settings, but it's very morbid. So this graph is a, from a paper in The Lancet uh, a few years ago, and it looked at the association between cancer incidence and mortality. So what you can see on the left is that in low-income countries, so each of these bars, again, the, the lines of different color, you don't have to read carefully, but these are all different types of cancers. And for each type of cancer, essentially across the board, when you live in a low-income area, the number of new cancer cases approximates the number of annual cancer deaths, so essentially one-to-one. -one. Whereas as you look to the right, in the United States, about for every 10 cancer cases, there are only two cancer deaths. So what this tells you is that across the board, not only is cancer common, but in low resource settings, it's very morbid. Um, so uh, that would tell you that global cancer should be a priority for researchers. And one of the questions I get asked is, well, is it actually a priority for the National Institutes of Health? Now, I don't pretend to be able to speak on behalf of the National Institutes of Health. I wish I could. I might explain <laughs> some of so my scores or uh, <laughs> other things like that. Um, but to the extent that I do understand them, I did have the opportunity of spending a week with Dr. Harold Varmus um, in Uganda when he came for our groundbreaking of our new facility last year. Um, and these are taken, uh, uh, he said a lot of things that would probably be off the record, uh, but of things that he has said on the record, um, there's two quotes that I'll give you here. So Dr. Varmus has said that few problems are more daunting or more tempting than alleviating disease in poor countries. And Dr. Niederhuber, his predecessor, a lot of people, we've been talking a lot about the elections coming up. All of you probably know that the director of the National Cancer Institute is the only of the National Institute of Health directors that is appointed by the president. So clearly, uh, Dr. Varmus's job might be in jeopardy come the results of the election uh, next week. Um, but nonetheless, uh, even the previous NCI director, uh, his comments were, for us to make true progress in cancer research, we must address cancer as a global phenomenon and extend our efforts to emerging and developing countries. So what I would say is that I think this continues to be a priority in NIH. There's now a new Office of Global Cancer uh, that's been established, and again, they've been very supportive of the work that we've been doing. Um, so I'm going to tell you about our work in Uganda. Um, Uganda, I'm just, uh, this is a model of, of uh, what I think could be done in many different places. Um, so the question that I always get asked is, why Uganda? A lot of times I also get asked, where is Uganda? Uh, <laughs> but I won't answer that. Well, I'll answer that question later. But right now I'll answer the why Uganda. So, uh, I study infection-related cancers. Uganda has the highest incidence of infection-related cancers anywhere in the world. Um, it had a single cancer treatment facility, which although it was somewhat run down um, and in need of some assistance when I first saw it in 2004, had a long established track record. It had over 200 scientific publications in cancer over the last 40 years. It was the first place where combination chemotherapy was given to treat cancer anywhere in the world, and it was the place where Epstein-Barr virus was first identified. Um, there's also a very large community of international researchers in Kampala and in Uganda in general. Uh, so when I wanted to propose doing things like isolating peripheral blood mononuclear cells or uh, placing tumor biopsies in liquid nitrogen, this was one of the few places where I thought that that could actually happen. Um, so another reason why Uganda, and I'm sorry that these are so graphic, but um, you know, I, uh, I'm not an oncologist. I'll say that as my disclaimer, uh, although my child tells everyone that I am. But, um, uh, but uh, I feel like I play one on TV. Uh, I do see a lot of cancer cases. Um, and these are five clinical presentations of cancer that I have never seen in seeing thousands of cancer patients in Seattle. Um, so the top left is a young boy with lymphadenopathic Kaposi sarcoma. 
Uh, the middle picture on the top is a patient with fungating Kaposi's sarcoma, a morphology that's never seen in the clinics in the United States. Uh, on the right is a woman with Kaposi's sarcoma, which again uh, are as rare as hen's teeth uh, in the United States. Uh, the bottom left is a child with Burkitt lymphoma, um, and the woman, the girl on the bottom right, also has Burkitt lymphoma, but an abdominal presentation. So, um, cancer. The point of these is to show you very graphically that cancer looks different in different parts of the world, and if it looks different, there has to be a different biology. That's my premise. And so the question is. What is the difference in this biology, and what does that tell you about the pathogenesis of malignancy? And I'll tell you about some of that work as I go through this. Um, so the equation of food that I found when I started working in Uganda in 2004 was a pretty dire equation. There was a, a population of 34 million people, so essentially the population of Canada, uh, highest rates of cancer in the world, one oncologist, uh, one cancer clinic center, and no chemotherapy, pain medications, or diagnostic equipment. So I summed that up as a cancer crisis. But there were a lot of opportunities, and so the question is, how do you balance this crisis with the opportunities for cancer research? Um, this is the history of the program that I started in 2004, and I'll take you through this history, but uh, it took basically eight years to get to this point. So in 2004, I established a collaboration with the director of the Uganda Cancer Institute uh, to, in principle, study infection-related cancers. In 2005, I was awarded a grant from the Doris Duke Foundation to actually study infection-related cancers, and that's what kicked us off. In 2008, our institution signed a formal memorandum of understanding and also signed them with the Ugandan Ministry of Health and McCary University. And those are very important because they actually hold all of these stakeholders to distinct promises. And we all try and keep those promises as we move ahead. Um, in 2008, we began a training program, which I'll tell you some more about. In 2011, we broke ground on our new training uh, cancer clinic, uh, training center, and research facility. And in 2014, that facility will be done. So that's the timeline, and I'll take you through some of these things now. So again, what I say about this program is that it's about the research, it's about clinical care, it's about training and capacity building, and it's about building an infrastructure to do all of these things. So today in my talk, while I might not go as deep as you might like to see for some of my research activities, I will at least go wide, and I'll certainly tell you about all of these things. If there are additional questions or concerns uh, about the research, I'm happy to go into those as well. Um, so now I want to turn to my research, and again, I mentioned that my research was on infection-related cancers. So this uh, on the left is what I call probably the most ignored article ever published in Life magazine um, from 40 years ago. Uh, so you see that the title on the left is New Evidence That Cancer May Be Infectious, but on the right it says Marilyn Monroe, the pictures you'll never see on the screen, and it's full of the spread of her in bathing suits. So I'm pretty convinced, although I wasn't alive to read this article, that it was widely overlooked. Um, but nonetheless, this was uh, the recognition 40 years ago, uh, indeed, that uh, cancer had an infectious etiology. Um, and uh, it's only slightly less ignored now, but, uh, but I will tell you a little bit about my view on this. Now, I'm trained as an infectious disease specialist. Um, and then, you know, there's an expression that to a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Uh, so to me, I think everything's an infectious disease. Uh, but the evidence would suggest that up to a quarter of human cancers are attributable to an infectious disease. It's actually about 22% now, but I think that there is a large percentage of cancers that have not yet been attributed to an infectious etiology. So I'm going to go with 25%. Uh, but when I look at the pieces of this pie, of the broad causes of cancer, um, what I would say is that it's very hard to do something about the environment, that genetics are very helpful for helping us to identify uh, you know, what the causes of cancer are, but we're not so good at changing your genetics. And the unknown, that's not very helpful. So of this pie, uh, right now I would say that we have the technology to eradicate, prevent, or better treat about 25% of the cancers worldwide. So that's, you could look at that as half empty and say that's not very many cancers, or you could look at that as half full and say what an opportunity to make a meaningful difference on 25% of cancers worldwide. So that's where, where our focus has been. Um, if you're curious about the types of cancers that are caused uh, by infectious diseases, this is a table from the Lancet Oncology that was published last month, and it uh, lists the different types of cancers that are caused by different infectious pathogens, and you can see that hepatocellular carcinoma attributable to hepatitis B and C viruses is the most common, uh, closely followed by uh, human papillomavirus-related cervical and anogenital cancers, and uh, Helicobacter pylori. Uh, so this is the list. The other thing that you'll notice is that the preponderance of these cases are in resource limited settings. So another reason uh, why to be in Uganda and why to be working on infection related cancers in Uganda, uh, I like to quote Willie Sutton. 
So Willie Sutton robbed banks uh, around the turn of the century, and they caught him. He wasn't the most intelligent guy, and they said, Willie, why do you rob banks? I mean, you just rob one bank after another. And he looked at them very quizzically, and he said, well, that's where the money is. Um, and so not to be so crude, but if you want to study infection-related cancers, you need to be where the money is. And that really is in places where these diseases are endemic, and that includes Africa. Um, so when I make a pitch for global oncology, what I like to say is that um, there are lots of reasons to study cancer in places other than the United States. And these are the main arguments why I would say that a, uh, you know, a, a, a cancer researcher in the United States should even be remotely interested in studying cancer in places other than the United States. So I would say that in places like Africa, there's a high incidence and concentration of cancer cases. So the Uganda Cancer Institute is the only cancer center in a five-country region. And so every cancer case from a five-country region comes to one place. Anyone who's done clinical cancer trials in the United States and has fought with 2% participant of, you know, patient enrollment in clinical trials, this is a very different situation. Um, there are opportunities by studying very advanced disease, and I'll show you in a minute, but over 80% of individuals present with end-stage cancer. Um, there's an ability to target unique tumor pathways, such as the MYC tumor oncogen. Um, there is an ability to investigate infection-related cancers and also the impact of immunosuppression on cancer biology. And then I think that there's a lot of interesting opportunities for comparative cancer biology. So I've been telling some people today that we just saw our first case of a 13-year-old girl with widely metastatic triple negative breast cancer. Not, uh, you know, uh, the youngest case that's been reported in the literature in the United States, I think, is 20. And so um, this is a very unusual disease, and I think that clearly by studying that patient, you would be able to make meaningful inferences about the biology of triple negative breast cancer, even here in the United States. Now, this sort of graph on the top is what I use as kind of my way home. I think any of us who are involved in research, let alone global research, can sometimes have their heads spun around and can really say, you know, what am I doing here? I've, I've been through, you know, every study we do has to go through seven IRBs. Uh, and so, you know, there are days where you just feel like you're mind-numbingly defeated. Um, and I always look to this slide. Uh, unfortunately, these aren't the same girls, but this is Susan on the left and Olivia on the right. And essentially what we're trying to do is take a patient who looks like the left and make them look like the right. Um, and so the way we've done this is through several distinct areas, epidemiology, cancer prevention, clinical trials, and translational science. And in the next few slides, what I'll try and do is just give you a very broad overview of the type of work that we've been doing in each of these areas. It's not meant to be exhaustive about the research hypotheses or scenarios, but it's meant to show you what I think are some of the opportunities that are afforded by doing this work in resource-limited settings. So first, a snapshot. So we have uh, enrolled over 7,000 participants uh, in over 25 studies um, at our site in Uganda over the last uh, six years. Um, we have collected over 150,000 biospecimens in a biospecimen repository. Um, and the types of studies have ranged uh, a broad range of cancers, and that's what you see here, and also uh, a broad range of types of studies, from randomized clinical trials to cancer registry studies to prospective cohort studies. Um, First, I want to start a little bit with the epidemiologic studies. And the reason I want to start with these is because I maintain that unless you know where you are right now, you're never going to know where you're going. So right now, there is very poor data on the incidence and trends in cancer survival in resource-limited settings, especially in Africa. So many of you may have heard this, but there are two cancer registries serving 6 million people that service all of 1 billion people in sub-Saharan Africa. Now, there are other cancer registries, but they are not yet certified as comprehensive by the, uh, by the uh, World Health Organization. And I think that we have more data than, than, than that. But really, what the point is, is that there's a paucity of data on what's going on out there. So one of the things we've really tried to do is lay a foundation for knowing trends in cancer incidence and survival in Uganda so that in the event we actually come up with something that actually changes those trends, for better or for worse, we can actually measure those and actually put metrics to the program that we are building. So I want to show you one example. Uh, this is an example of um, a study where, uh, so remember, you know, we all sort of take a lot of things for granted in the United States, such as having a unique identification number, although there's problems with ours. At least, you know, people have social security numbers. There's ways of identifying individuals in the United States and when they participate in population-based cancer registries. In Uganda, there is no national identification number. And so it's very hard to link data about cancer incidence trends and any other factors. So one of the things I've been very interested in is how antiretroviral therapy may change the incidence of cancer in places. You, in the United States, there was a tenfold decrease in AIDS-associated malignancies within a year of initiating antiretroviral therapy. The question is, would you see that in places like Sub-Saharan Africa? 
So essentially what we did was we were able to link the cancer registry in Uganda to uh, records that are maintained by PEPFAR about the countrywide use of antiretroviral therapy. And what you can see is for here for the three AIDS-defining cancers, Kaposi sarcoma, cervical cancer, and non-Hodgkin lymphoma, what we saw is that even though now uh, between 2000 and 2008, 40% of the people who need antiretroviral therapy now have access to it, still not close to 100%, the incidence of these cancers has changed very minimally. There's been a 4% decrease with each 10% increase in ART coverage for Kaposi's. There's been an increase in non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and no impact on cervical cancer. So certainly the dramatic effects that we saw on cancer incidence um, in this country, we are not seeing in Uganda, although granted there are very much differences in amount of population covered. But these are some of the registry-based work that we are doing to look at trends in cancer incidence and how they maybe depend on another factor like ART use. Um, in the United States, we spent a lot of time, um, we don't even know uh, much about survival of cancer in the setting of HIV in the United States. So we spent some time trying to characterize this, and this is a paper we published last year, looking at the two-year overall survival of cancer in the setting of HIV in the United States. Across the board, this is generally worse uh, than patients without cancer. But we wanted to know this so that we could begin to compare this to what is the impact of having cancer and HIV in Uganda. In Uganda, at the Uganda Cancer Institute, 60% of the patients with all cancers have HIV co-infection. So HIV and cancer are a combination that go almost like peanut butter and jelly um, in Uganda. And so the question is, how, what's the impact of these two comorbid diseases? Well, again, when you think about how you would get at that, these are how we've done it. This is the records room at the Uganda Cancer Institute, and this is Han Nguyen, uh, our former epi doctoral student who's now at the CDC, who basically went through all of these records by hand. And what I'll show you are some of the results of what we know about survival after a diagnosis of cancer in Uganda. Again, really the first data that I'm aware of that really start to look at survival after a diagnosis of cancer in Sub-Saharan Africa. So first, one of the things you'll notice, this is a graph that looks at the stage of cancer at presentation. Uh, and you can see that here it is divided between HIV positive and HIV negative. Easy take home message is that there's no difference in stage based on your HIV status. But what you'll see is that over 80% of individuals present with street stage three or stage four cancer across the board. And so this has clearly got to be an effort of global oncology programs, downstaging cancer. Um, the observation of the head of our oncology unit at the University of Washington when he came to the Cancer Institute is that 90% of the patients who were in the hospital at that moment wouldn't even be candidates for therapy in Seattle. They'd be sent for palliative care. So this is something that really needs to be done is downstaging cancer. And here you can see the data are quite striking. Um, here, these are the first data on survival. So over, uh, over 3,000 charts were abstracted to get data on survival for various cancers. And again, you're not meant to read these data, but this is one year survival, and this is a pretty standard Kaplan-Meier curve. And you can see that even among patients who managed to make it to the Cancer Institute to get therapy, one year overall survival is universally pretty poor. Surprisingly, it was best for breast cancer, which you can see up top, uh, it was about uh, over 80%. Uh, and it was worse actually for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, which you see at the bottom with uh, a one year overall survival that was about 60%. But again, these are the first data that actually look to see what is the survival after a diagnosis of cancer, and important not so much in them themselves, but to see when you change an intervention, how this may change or improve over time. Um, another question that sort of exists is, is the biology and the response to treatment of these diseases similar? This was a study where we looked at response to treatment for Kaposi sarcoma, and we looked at all patients who presented with Kaposi sarcoma at our clinic in Seattle. There were about 200 patients over a couple of year period, and in Uganda where there were several thousand patients over a couple of year period. But what you can see is that the red line and the blue line, the red line represents Kampala and the blue line represents Seattle, and the top bars are overall response, and the bottom line is complete responses. But what you can see is that if you actually were afforded access to care, your response response to therapy was very similar in both settings. And the reason I like these data is they get over this myth that you can't do anything about cancer in resource limited settings. It's too complicated of a disease to treat. These actually suggest that if you can get people to treatment, then actually there's some efficacy. There's also novel predictors of response to efficacy. So we found, for instance, that having a low body mass index was associated with a five-fold increased risk of not responding to therapy. We found that the type of antiretroviral therapy you were on made a huge difference. So whether you were on a protease inhibitor, 
compared to a protease, non-protease inhibitor regimen was associated with a 16-fold increased odds of responding to your therapy. And finally, um, this is obvious, but with each 10% increase in the ideal dose of chemotherapy that you received, and we looked at this because access is such a problem, your odds of resolving your cancer increase twofold. So again, what that means is that we really need to work on strategies to downstage cancer and also to make sure that people get complete courses of therapy. So adherence is a key issue. Um, we also wanted to look specifically at non hodgkins <coughs> lymphoma. And here we found actually that the, the bottom line for this study was again that there were novel factors which predicted outcome. All of the factors which we use in the United States to predict outcome of lymphoma were not predictive of outcome at all. So the International Prognostic Index and the LDH were not predictive of survival uh, in Uganda. What was most predictive of survival was actually your hemoglobin level. And again, um, I'm not sure why that is, but now this has come out of three other studies that we've done now with breast cancer, esophageal cancer, and Kaposi's sarcoma as well. So clearly there's something about anemia that is predisposing these patients. Now whether it's causal or it's just merely associated, I can't tell you. But again, these are things that I think we really are seeing now by doing detailed studies of survival in the setting of cancer uh, in Uganda. Uh, we've also looked at pediatric malignancies. These are things that I think are not really well established. So again, kids with Kaposi's sarcoma just don't exist in the United States, but the left are survival curves for kids with different stages of Kaposi's I'm sorry, the left is with kids with Burkitt's and non-Burkitt's lymphoma survival curves, and the right is Kaposi's sarcoma uh, on the top overall and on the bottom with, with mild or advanced disease. So again, what you're seeing is that even among kids, they are very morbid conditions, but that, again, they are very frequent in Uganda. And these are things that, again, I think we need to spend more time looking at. Um, I'll step away from the epidemiology studies for a moment, and I want to talk a little bit about uh, the more translational work that we've been doing. Um, so this is from my favorite medical journal, The New Yorker, um, and it says, uh, it's pictures on the standing in the sun, and it says, just don't stand there looking for cancerous. Um, if it were only that easy, uh, but a lot of the work that we've got, uh, done is to look into cancer biomarkers. And so the reason I think that this is a very fertile field is that with infection-related cancers, you don't have to be so smart. You have generally many, many years between the acquisition of the infection and the development of the cancer. And so we have a lot of opportunities over that time period to make uh, meaningful observations and interventions to prevent the development of cancer. So I'll tell you about a couple of things on this pathway. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about some of the work we've done to identify how these viral oncogens are acquired and transmitted. And then I'll tell you a little bit about some work that we've done to both inhibit these, uh, uh, these viral infections from replicating in a goal to prevent them from developing malignancy. And finally, I'll talk a little bit about biomarkers. So what is happening in this intervening time period between when someone acquires the infection and when they develop a malignancy that may inform cancer prevention strategies. Um, so this was a, a body of work that I had done in Seattle to develop a serodiagnostic test for human herpes virus 8 infection. And what I can tell you is that after eight years of trying this, I'm done. Um, it is a very difficult uh, uh, virus to make a serodiagnostic assay against. I've gone from uh, being mad, uh, I've kind of gone through all of the stages of grieving, um, uh, but now I'm finally in acceptance. Um, and I think that what is really interesting is that I, I've been ignoring a very important message with that this is really telling us something about the biology of Kaposi's sarcoma associated herpes virus, that I actually now think it's immune evasion that is making it so challenging for us to detect certain humoral antibodies, and we've learned a lot from this. But all I wanted initially when I did this was to tell someone who was infected with this virus from someone who wasn't. And I still can't do that to this day. Um, but a large body of work in Seattle to really identify how this, uh, how we can identify <laughs> infected individuals and begin to look at novel risk factors for transmission of the virus. And make a long story short, although we did develop an assay, it's not the most sensitive or specific, but it was good enough for government work, and we used it to make inferences about transmission. And we found that human herpes virus A was probably transmitted through saliva. Um, in doing that work, we then sort of put the serologic antibody tests aside and wanted to look at direct virologic tests. So what was happening in these individuals uh, who were infected with human <coughs> virus 8, and could we make any inferences about those that went on to Kaposi's sarcoma versus those who remained asymptomatically infected in their lifetime? So this graph that you see on the right is a very complicated graph. I call it my admiral's uh, you know, lapel uh, uh, diagram. Um, but essentially the way to read this diagram is that each row of the diagram is a participant that we followed for anywhere between one and 360 consecutive days. And on each of those days, we collected blood and saliva. Um, 
The color of the bars that you see, so each of those individual cells within the row is the amount of virus that was detected in saliva. And these are ranked in order of uh, these 70 individuals from days when the virus was frequently found and the <coughs> color of the bar is the quantity of virus. So a red bar is virus that's found in over a million copies per milliliter. Uh, a blue bar is no virus was detected and a gray was that the sample went missing. But what you can see is that there's a dichotomy. I think with your naked eye, you could pretty much be able to draw a line and say that there are some patients above which they have the virus detected almost on every day that you look and in very high quantity. And then there's a group of people that really almost never have the virus detected, even though we know that they are infected with the virus. So what this tells us is that we think that there are different measures of how one controls these chronic viral infections. Um, and maybe it's, if we can identify those factors associated with the control of these viral infections, we would be able to identify those factors that predispose uh, to development of Kaposi's sarcoma. And indeed, what we found is that these individuals on the top are the individuals who went on to develop Kaposi's sarcoma or multicentric Castleman's disease and other complications of human herpes virus 8 infection. So um, we repeated this study in Uganda. This was actually my Doris Duke grant. And uh, although the graph is displayed differently here, here each column is an individual. And what you find is the proportion of days in which virus was detected in blood or in saliva. And the cells are broken into patients who have uh, who are HIV negative on the left, I'm sorry, on the top, and HIV positive on the bottom, uh, and folks who are with and without Kaposi's sarcoma. So one interesting thing about Uganda is that there are patients who have endemic or HIV negative Kaposi's sarcoma. And essentially, the take-home message of the study was that the virus was detected in both blood and saliva in almost all of the days that you looked in individuals with Kaposi's sarcoma, um, and that it was found very frequently in both HIV-positive and negative individuals in Uganda, which was very different uh, than what we see in Seattle. So essentially, in Uganda, there is a much higher prevalence of viremia with human herpes virus 8, something that's almost never seen in the United States. And again, whatever is controlling the dissemination of virus from the, from the oropharynx to the central compartment is probably a key pathogenic mechanism for why you go on to develop Kaposi's sarcoma. So I'll tell you a little bit more about what we're doing to try and look at that. Another concept that's very, very important with these viral oncogens is when you acquire them. Um, so the question was, um, is the timing of acquisition associated with how well you control these viruses? And the answer is yes. Um, and the way we sort of tried to look at this is that we went to the antenatal clinic at Malago Hospital. It's the largest <coughs> antenatal clinic in the world. They have the highest fertility rate in Uganda. And so um, we took women before they gave birth, and we enrolled them in a study uh, where we collected samples from them, and then we were at the delivery collecting samples from the cord blood and from the infant when they were first born. And we followed the mother, <coughs> the infant, and all members of the household weekly at home for five years. And in doing that, we tried to characterize patterns of viral replication. And we've done this now for all seven human herpes viruses and several other DNA viruses. So it's a wealth of information that we're still sorting through. But this is a very representative picture of what you see. So what you see here is in the blue bars, um, those are um, the, the one of the siblings in the household. And you can this is for human herpes virus A. And each of these is a week. And the bar height is a quantity. And you can see that every day, that every time we sampled this sibling's saliva, they had very high quantities of human herpes virus 8 in saliva. Um, what you can see is that the red bar is the mother, and she was shedding uh, HHV from saliva at the time of delivery of the infant, and then sporadically around throughout the rest of the five-year period. And what you see is in the green bars, you see the, probably the time at which that child acquired human herpes virus 8 infection. Now, correlating that with the mother or with the sibling might be a challenge, we're working on that molecularly, but we also now can study all of the events. We have peripheral blood mononuclear cells as well as viral isolates from that time period of initial acquisition. And what we're now looking to do is to sort of characterize the immunomaturation of the immune response to these viral oncogens <coughs> over time. So these are, again, the type of studies that we found. But what we found is, you can see on the next study, is this is the prevalence of EVV detection in plasma by age in the cohort, looking at, um, again, all of the siblings and all of the primary kids combined. And you can certainly see that the frequency with which you detect EVV and the quantity in the peripheral blood is dramatically uh, relation, in proportional to, or inversely proportional to the age of the infant or the child. So again, we think that there is a lot to be learned here uh, about the timing of acquisition of these viral oncogens, the control of their replication, and then how that eventually will, again, we're following all of these kids prospectively. Although these cancers are rare, we do think that we will see incident cancers in some of these kids and be able to make inferences about viral dynamics and immune maturation. 
Um, uh, I think that the other thing we've been very interested in is how, if replication is really important, and if this is the key step along the pathway to development of malignancy, can we inhibit viral replication and prevent the development of malignancy? So this was a paper I published in Blood several years ago where we had a group of patients with an hhv 8 associated disease called multicentric Castleman's disease. And we showed for the first time that you could treat hhv 8 infection with uh, an antiviral drug, ancyclovir. And when you inhibited their replication, the patients felt better. This is a disease that's traditionally treated with conventional chemotherapy. So it suggested that for some of these viral oncogens, by inhibiting their replication, you can inhibit some of the clinical manifestations of disease. Um, we expanded this to do a randomized trial, and indeed, even in a randomized trial, there was vast inhibition of replication of human herpes virus 8 with an antiviral drug. And actually, this is the first and only randomized controlled trial of an antiviral drug against human herpes virus 8. Um, this was interesting, but, you know, again, cyclovir is a somewhat toxic medication. It's not something that we could give widely in a population. So we were looking for other opportunities. Um, we looked at, uh, we wanted to look at the effect of antiretroviral therapy. And although all of the current HIV antiretroviral drugs shouldn't have an effect on most of the viral oncogens, we actually found that there was a pretty dramatic effect. So what we did was we took 10,000 patient days in which we had clinical samples uh, either saliva or blood, um, from individuals who were infected with human herpes virus 8. And we compared the amount of virus that was detected in their saliva on days when they were on a specific antiretroviral drug or when they were not. And looking across the board, again, that diagram may be a little too small for you to see, but what we found was that essentially on all of the protease inhibitors, there was essentially no virus detected on any days that an individual was taking these protease inhibitors. And that was more than 1,800 days of observation. So clearly, these protease inhibitors were having a very potent effect on human herpes virus 8 replication. When we looked in vitro and set up an assay system to monitor this, we found that indeed the antiretroviral drug nelfinivir had a very strong anti-human herpes virus 8 effect. And indeed, we found that the effect wasn't mediated by effect on the virus, but rather on cellular pathways that inhibited replication. That means for the non-virologists here that it's very difficult to induce resistance or uh, mutations because it's a cellular pathway, not a, not a viral pathway. Um, and it also means that there may be utility uh, of targeting this pathway um, in, in studies where you want to prevent viral replication. Um, so indeed, now there's been, uh, you nelfinavir know, has had a number of other effects. It's been shown to have, have strong pro-apoptotic and anti-neoplastic effects. There's actually 16 clinical trials of nelfinavir right now being used in HIV-negative individuals as a treatment for solid tumors. Um, the results have been somewhat mixed, but nonetheless, I think that it could clearly have a role um, in the prevention of viral-associated malignancies. So the question is, how would you study that? Um, and uh, maybe I'll skip this slide. Um, well, I'll come back to it. But there's a slide later where uh, I'll show you a study that we have ongoing. We're actually about to launch in the field um, where we are comparing the addition of nelfinavir to a standard HIV regimen to see whether that's effective in reducing the incidence of AIDS malignancies. So I'll talk about that um, in a little bit. Um, I have two slides here on what we're doing to try and look at the human immune response. I've talked about it very broadly to say that the immune system is controlling these viral infections. This was a study where we looked at neutralizing antibodies to human herpes virus 8. And indeed, we found that in patients with Kaposi's sarcoma, neutralizing antibodies were completely absent. Um, whereas in other asymptomatic forms of uh, HHV infection, there were very high titers of neutralizing antibodies. This study was done in Seattle, and one of the confounders was that all of our patients with Kaposi's sarcoma had HIV. So uh, we didn't have any endemic Kaposi's sarcoma in Seattle. But in doing the study in Uganda, we repeated it and found that even in endemic Kaposi's sarcoma, neutralizing antibodies are absent. And again, we think that there is clearly a role of neutralizing antibodies in the prevention of these malignancies, but how much they contribute is unclear. So we're trying to assemble a more comprehensive picture. We're looking very closely at T-cell immunity, and we published recently that gamma delta T-cells, a cell line that we were attracted to because they have, they're intimately involved in the control of viral replication at mucosal sites, and that's where these herpes viruses tend to replicate. Um, we found indeed that a deficiency in uh, gamma delta T-cells, the, the V delta 1 subtype, was associated with poor control of human herpes virus A replication. So again, we're trying to put together a comprehensive picture. I think we've shown that replication is associated with progression to malignancy, that there's a phenotype in individuals where there is poor control of replication, and now we're trying to look at what is the association between specific components of the immune response and that replication phenotype. Um, 
I also want to just mention that we've done a lot of work with tumor genomics. Um, so one of the things I mentioned is that the, the more, what you see, the morphology of cancer, looks very different in Uganda than where it looks elsewhere. And so here are two very unique morphologies of Kaposi's sarcoma. You see uh, on the right, there's a patient with plaque-like Kaposi's sarcoma. And on the left, there's a patient with nodular Kaposi's sarcoma. And what we did was we looked at the expression of latent and lytic human herpes virus A genes and found that the macular phenotype was associated with a preponderance of lytic gene expression and that the nodular phenotype was associated with uh, more latent gene expression. So again, what this means for the pathobiology of the tumor is not clear. One inference is that perhaps by tar targeting nodular Kaposi's sarcoma with anti-herpes virus 8 uh, drugs, you might be able to make a contribution to the clinical care. But it also may suggest why there's different morphologies of this disease. I think that this model and looking at what is the uh, gene expression of viral gene products um, with different subtypes of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and EBV and with different uh, presentations of HPV-associated disease may also lead to observations about the biology of these cancers. And again, I would say it's, it's this application of what we're seeing at the bedside uh, to the bench uh, that, that we're actually being able to make these observations. Um, this very confusing diagram shows a little bit about um, what, what other things we're doing with tumor biopsies. So um, we've established a system by which we can uh, take a piece of tumors that are established from the operating, uh, that are obtained from the operating room, and send them off for a detailed genomic and also proteomic analysis. And essentially, the take-home message of this proteomic study that we've done for Kaposi's sarcoma shows that almost all of the uh, of the proteins that are overexpressed in the KS biopsies compared to normal skin um, or to peripheral blood map back to the interferon gamma pathway. And we know that interferon gamma is very important um, in the control of human herpes virus replication. Now what this led to is that it led to the identification of 11 proteins that are secreted and widely abundant in peripheral blood that we're now looking at and evaluating as biomarkers. So our thought is, is that because these, these 11 secreted proteins are highly abundant, they may be very useful for the early detection of Kaposi's sarcoma. So could you use that in HIV clinics to identify patients who are, have sort of subclinical chaos that then you would target for more aggressive antiretroviral therapy? Or could they be used as prognostic biomarkers to suggest those patients who do poorly? But again, it's this proteomic approach of chaos biopsy material that's allowed us to do. Um, finally, we just uh, were awarded a grant from NCI to, uh, to work on the tumor genomics project, and we have been isolating uh, uh, tumor tissue from about 600 individuals uh, where we will try and understand whether the basic genomics of four sentinel tumors differs between what we see in Uganda from what is seen in the United States. And I think that that comparative genomics, especially with the well-annotated clinical phenotypes that we will have, will lead to important inferences about cancer, uh, both in the US and in Uganda. Um, this has also led to another grant that I just got, which is one of the NCI's provocative questions grants. Um, this grant uh, hypothesizes that there is an infectious cause of many cancers that don't yet have an identified infectious etiology. And so myself and Denise Galloway at the Hutch will actually be looking to identify viral etiologies for lung cancer, HPV negative anogenital cancers, and EDV negative lymphomas. So more to, more to follow on that, but we're very excited about this new project, which again will be based on tumor materials uh, and serum samples from the Uganda cohorts. Um, I mentioned again that I think that this work is very nice in, its, in understanding the biology of cancer, but really can we do anything about it? Um, and this study is a study that came out of these findings. So by making these inferences about nofinavir, we were conducting, a, in conjunction with the AIDS Malignancy Consortium, a 1,400-person trial to see whether the addition of nofinavir to conventional antiretroviral therapy prevents the development of malignancies in individuals with HIV. And so that's a real example of taking an observation that was initially made in <coughs> clinical cohorts to the, ben that, to the bench and then from the bench back into the implementation science arena. So we're excited about that as well. Um, finally, where all of this is culminating is that um, because of the work that we've done in Uganda, NCI has asked us to, to see what it would take to, uh, to set up a network to study Burkitt lymphoma. Um, and so uh, we've just embarked on a project to set up a network to study Burkitt's lymphoma in 23 different countries, uh, with 23 different sites. I think it's only 18 different countries, but they're in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa as well as Central and South America. 
And over the next several months, we'll be evaluating these sites for their readiness to participate in both clinical and translational studies. And for those sites that have a high incidence of Burkitt's lymphoma but are deemed to be not ready, we'll be working with them to build the infrastructure to participate in clinical care and clinical research. So it's a project that we're very excited to kick off uh, this month. Um, I want to turn my attention now just in the last few minutes of the talk after that sort of dizzying head ride through uh, what the translational science was to talk about some of the other initiatives that I really think are cornerstones to the program. And those are the clinical care and the educational and capacity building components. Um, so to date, in the last eight years, we've trained over 200 Ugandans and Americans um, in cancer research. Um, and we've had this through three NIH training grants, but um, it's been um, a wide variety of disciplines. Um, I mentioned that there was one oncologist when I first came to the Uganda Cancer Institute who trained 12 in Seattle, so now there is a total of 13 oncologists, still not enough for 34 million people. Um, but that type of capacity building has been very, very important to doing the type of work that we are very interested in doing. And for allowing Uganda to develop the capacity to care for their own cancer patients in the country. Um, the training program has been very successful. The Ugandan physicians have all of the rights and privileges of our medical oncology fellows. You can see them here in the clinic with myself and Ali Press, and they're in the clinic with Dr. Grelo. But it's been a very successful program. And I would also say it's been extraordinarily successful for people in the United States who haven't seen a way to get involved in global cancer research. So we've sort of opened that pathway. Um, we have now uh, the first NCI K23 grant uh, to be awarded overseas. Uh, and again, we see that as being a pathway uh, to uh, allowing independence in our junior investigators. Um, clinical care capacity, I think, is really key as well. Um, you know, again, it's very clear that coming to the Uganda Cancer Institute in the past has largely been a death sentence. And so how do you get around that? So I mentioned that we've increased the number of practicing oncologists. We've also uh, we've started a pilot project where we've come up with a standardized protocol for treating every patient with Burkitt lymphoma. It's not a novel agent protocol. They're all getting the three drugs that were first investigated in the 1960s. But we're administering them uniformly and with optimal supportive care. And essentially the question we're asking is how good can care get based on the current resources before you go and invest in additional resources. Um, we now have uh, nine uh, meetings each, uh, each week that are attended by, uh, by both sides of our, uh, you know, a teleconferencing sort of setup, I think much like you do here. Um, and that's been very, uh, it's been actively attended by our clinicians on both sides of the pond. Um, and we're very happy to say that we're starting, uh, we started construction on a new uh, facility, which I think will really be the first of its kind, the first training facility, uh, research facility, and outpatient clinic devoted to cancer in sub-Saharan Africa. We've also developed clinical guidelines for the three most common cancers uh, in adults and kids, and looking to see whether the implementation of those guidelines leads to better care. This is a, a projection of what the new Cancer Institute will look like in 2014, and we're all very much looking forward to that. Um, and finally, I just want to end with a slide that I call the, the benefits. And so if you look at the slide very closely, even though it doesn't line up perfectly, what you'll see is actually that the benefits for participating in a program like this are the same for people in Uganda and the United States. So on both sides, I think that this leads to the earlier diagnosis of cancer through biomarker discovery, the cheaper and more effective treatments for cancer, and again, developing treatments specifically for Ugandans and Americans based on similarities and differences in cancer biology that we observe in these two settings. So um, I want to stop by, by thanking uh, my collaborators. Um, so all of these studies have been done in collaboration with the Uganda Cancer Institute. Uh, we have a staff of 40 individuals there that help us do these studies. Uh, the work has been supported by a number of mechanisms, uh, Doris Duke Foundation, USAID, and then both NIAID and uh, NCI at the National Institutes of Health. Um, and uh, I thank you all for, for listening. So maybe I'll stop now, take a deep breath, and maybe take a few questions. <laughs> Do we have questions for Dr. Casper? Anyone still with me? <laughs> Corey, do you want to comment on uh, uh, the issue of inflammatory biomarkers uh, and predisposing to different types of cancer in, in, uh, in Uganda, for example? Yeah, so, well, I'm not exactly sure. Um, you know, I think that the, um, the issue really that I think is, uh, that's becoming increasingly clear is that um, it's this interplay between the host genomics and the viral infection that is leading to uh, the development of cancer. And I think that, as I said, uh, with KS, most of the biomarkers are mapping to an inflammatory pathway, the interferon gamma pathway. 
Um, we're also finding, as I mentioned before, that a depletion of some of these important you know, gamma delta T cells. Um, and as I mentioned to you, these, uh, these MDSCs, which are cells that are really important for shutting off inflammation, are important um, in these malignancies. I would say that the work to date has been somewhat mixed. I think if you look in the literature, um, a lot of people are sort of looking in the peripheral blood and inflammatory cytokines and trying to correlate that with uh, a cancer phenotype. And I think that that's probably not the best place to look. And I think it's very hard to measure these, these, uh, these inflammatory biomarkers in the peripheral blood. So my hope is that as we improve our ability to look at gene expression arrays and proteomic assays of these tumors, we'll actually get a better signal of what's happening with the inflammatory sort of biosphere within these tumors. Um, and as we have prospective cohort studies where we have individuals, where we can have intra-individual sort of dampening down so we can measure someone's inflammatory biomarkers, maybe in the purple blood, before they develop cancer and after, and how each person acts as their own control, I'm hoping that the signals will become a little bit more clear. But for right now, I would say it's clearly got to be important, but the inflammatory signals to focus in on are getting lost in, I think, a larger picture. Yes, Nelson. Is it be looking at the gut microbiome of these two the, the population or the skin microbiome of these people? Yeah. yeah, it's an interesting question. So the question is, is anyone looking at the microbiome? So I would say that I think up until now, a lot of the work on infectious diseases and cancer has been looking at a single microorganism and a single malignancy. And I think that that's probably a little naive. I mean, we know very much that there's an interplay, for instance, between the herpes viruses and HIV. And so why is it not possible that the either microbial community of bacteria fungi or viruses as a whole is actually contributing to the incidence, uh, to the manifestations of these diseases. The place where we're starting to look at that is in Burkitt's lymphoma. So there's a theory, and I admit I think it's a little bit you know, out there, but it's at least a place to start, is that uh, it's actually, as you know, the, the Burkitt's tumors in Uganda frequently present in the jaw. And so, and there's been an observation at least that there's an association with dental eruption. So certainly, out, certainly after the kids, have their, some of their initial molars come in, they start to develop these Burkitt's lymphoma. Now I think it could just be coincidental timing, but one of the explanations that's been offered is that there may be a change in the oral microbiota that then leads to a permissive inflammatory environment for the development of malignancy. So to get at that, we actually have now been obtaining, uh, you know, fresh frozen saliva uh, and then interdental uh, samples uh, to look at how the microbiota changes in these kids from birth to the time that they develop their dental eruptions. And hopefully we'll, I mean, I hate to say this, but hopefully we'll see a number of cases of Burkitt's in this highly endemic area that will allow us to look at how that changes and predisposes to the development of Burkitt's. But that's the only work that we're doing. I think that clearly, more globally, there is a lot more work that's being done on the gut microbiota and how that's influencing things like uh, gastric cancer. Um, but I think that's a very important area um, that is one that's very ripe for investigation. But we are not doing very much of that at the moment. Yes, Mike. Corey, it's an incredible body of work. Uh, clearly, you've worked very hard to get funding opportunities to, to get these programs initiated. Could you comment on sustainability? You know, how do you, tra how do you transition these from the initial funding and research opportunities to uh, the local governments uh, picking these, these kinds of activities up so that they'll have a long-term impact? Yeah, that's a really important question. So um, I think that there's a couple of principles. So I mentioned these MOUs that we've signed, these memorandums of understanding. And you know, at first I was sort of like, oh, this is just, you know, I have a long list on my whiteboard in my office of the things that I was never trained to do despite having three degrees um, <laughs> that I do all the time. I'm sure we all feel this way. Um, but one of those is negotiating memorandums of understanding. Um, but they're really important, actually, in the end. And the reason I think that they're so important is that our memorandum of understanding with McCary University says that for every person that we put in a long-term training program, they will be bonded for five years of an academic appointment at McCary. Um, the memorandum of understanding with the, with the government of Uganda says that all of these individuals who receive long-term training will actually be, be made ministry employees, and that in Uganda is sort of, uh, has a number of things that, are, you know, that go along with that as, as benefits. Um, all of those things, though, don't ensure a sustainability of a research program or a research career. So what do you need to assure that? Well, you, you know, I think there's a, in vaccinology, there's this concept of the push and the pull, right? You can either mandate that every, you know, vaccine maker in the world makes a vaccine at prices that, you know, the res low resource, you know, countries can obtain it, or you can actually say that they'll come up with a way to develop a market so that low resource regions can actually buy these products, that's the pull model, at a way that the market can bear. 
So what we say is that we can mandate that you know someone goes back to Uganda. A lot of programs, I don't know if you guys do this, but they make the trainees sign a statement saying, I will go back to my home country for five years. Well, to me, that's almost like a prison sentence. Like, what's the point of sending, you know, you train someone, you invest all of this in them, and then you send them back to an environment where they can't use their skills. So although we do make our trainees do that, um, we also try and back that up with support, and we try and make that support come from the local government. So again, by having the ministry and the medical and the and the medical school uh, provide commitments to faculty positions, that's one way. The second way is that um, when we sort of the goal of our research lab, so we do 75,000 of these molecular biology assays and about 50,000 of our other assays in country in Uganda. And so we have a laboratory there. We have it staffed and operated by Ugandans. And so what we ask the government to do is to use that as a contract lab by which they do their clinical work, and then we use that as well as our research grants to help maintain it and offset the operating costs so that it's perpetually available. So I think that this sort of model of having a synergy between um, using a shared set of resources, um, making the government and the local community sort of buy into this, um, and then frankly for me it involves a lot of planning to try and make sure that when we sort of put in a technology or a piece of equipment that I can see a long way into the future, a way how this will be the backbone of, of the work that we'll, the researchers will want to do. So, you know, recognizing that what people, what the researchers want and need in country is thermocyclers and flow cytometers, and so those are things that we make investments in. Other things that people have asked us to invest in, we haven't because they're not sustainable. So it's not a complete answer. It's a problem. I mean, I think, you know, um, I, I was told by the minister in Uganda, the previous minister of health, that um, Uganda couldn't possibly, you know, do, you know, make any investments in, you know, in cancer or cancer research or cancer care. And it was ironic because the day that I was told that by this person, the Ugandan president announced that $720 million of Russian fighter jets were just purchased. <laughs> so, you know, I went back to them and very politely I said, is it can't or won't? You know, so I think that, um, I think that um, they came back to me and said, you know, um, we've never been told that cancer is an important public health priority. We're not seeing that, you know, no one from our own country is telling us that. And frankly, when Bill Gates comes and sits at my desk, he says, you have to go do something about HIV, tuberculosis, and malaria. So my answer, my long answer to your short question is that I think that by raising the literacy of the importance of cancer as a public health impact in that region, um, that makes more focus from the government. When I started in Uganda, $10,000 was the budget from the Ugandan Government Ministry of Health and the Cancer Institute. Last year, it was $1.5 million. Now, $1.5 million for you know, over 20,000 cancer cases is not nearly enough money, but that shows that I think when you shine a light on this, that you will find sort of a bilateral support. So the model, I would say, is generate the data to show that this is an important issue generate the data to show that a dollar spent is actually well spent and actually returns that investment. And then be very shrewd about how you ask your partners to commit with not just words, but with dollars or shillings uh, to, to the work you're trying to do. So, you know, I'm not, I'm not standing here saying that, I, that this has been future-proofed for the next 20 years, but I do think that there is an ongoing commitment by our program and by the Ugandan government that I think at least for the next decade, you know, uh, things are in a pretty solid form. Other questions? Corey, in that cohort of 300 families that you're studying, do you have hepatitis B data? So we do, um, yeah, and that's actually launched another interesting area. Um, it's, I mean, I'll, uh, so we do have some data on the incidence of hep B. We find that there is about 40% of these kids who acquire the infection sort of around the age of two. Uh -huh. um, but the other thing that's interesting is that um, we have another cohort that we've been looking at of adults with HIV infection. And right now in Uganda, as I'm sure this is in Tanzania, universal hepatitis B vaccination is at birth, but there's no catch-up vaccination. Uh -huh. So HIV-infected adults who are hepatitis negative are thought to not be at risk for it because you only get it as a child in the pandemic area. Mm -hmm. We're actually finding a very high incidence of hepatitis B in adults with HIV infection. Incidence? So, incidence, yeah. That's so, interesting. So again, that suggests that um, although the pediatric cohort is very interesting for these 40% of cases that are acquired at a young age, there is continuous acquisition at an older age as well. Interesting. Yeah. Well, Corey, thank you for traveling here. It's been a pleasure to have you with us. Yeah.